They, they say that uh, apart from obviously uh, COVID and social distancing, the other the other words of the year for 2020 are going to be, I'm on mute or unmute me. And uh, we, we're no different. We've suffered a bit from that today. So thanks for your patience. Uh, I've got a few questions that came in by email ahead of the seminar, uh, ahead of the uh, webcast. And uh, I thought that uh, I'd just uh, talk to some of them because there were some consistent themes that we may not have touched on enough. And then I'm going to turn over to my colleague, uh, Tali, who, uh, who's been looking at the questions coming in, and uh, again, there's been a lot of questions coming in, which is great, and uh, she'll ask them around the panel. But, but I'll kick off with uh, a couple of things. I should kick off with a, a comment before I go to the questions. And as I said, uh, if the decision is made final and in some similar shape or form, there will be that period until April or June to not only work with importers and wholesalers on what they need to do to get stocks available here within Australia, but also a big communications and information campaign for doctors on what to do, pharmacists, and also a broader general public information campaign. Clearly, it doesn't make sense to do that campaign yet because we don't know what the decision, the final decision will be. So one of the general questions that came through early on is, uh, hey, you guys uh, uh, look a bit uh, uh, inconsistent in that you're looking at this for uh, vaping liquids and nicotine, but you're not talking at all about any changes to the regulation of cigarettes. And I just wanted to explain that uh, in law, there are certain things that 50, 60 years ago, the 1960s, I think it was, so that's 60 years ago, were actually carved out of the TGA regulatory system. And that includes cigarettes for smoking, because it was at a time when states and territories were starting to regulate age of sales, and eventually in the 70s, uh, TV advertising, point of sale advertising, uh, and so forth. And so it, together with a few other things, uh, camera photographic chemicals and printer's inks were other things that were carved out of TGA regulation uh, at that time. So we have no scope over, over smoking nicotine for, uh, for smoking. Uh, so I just wanted to explain why that's not in consideration. We do have scope over heat not burn tobacco, for example, because it isn't burnt. And that's a letter of the law and our legal advice. Another question or series of questions that comes through is saying, well, what will be, be the controls on flavours and strengths? And as I said, at this stage, there aren't envisaged to be uh, controls on flavours and strengths. It may be that some people will say, well, get rid of the ones that are you know, really attractive to young kids. Some other people have asked a question at yesterday's uh, webinar as to whether concentrate of nicotine for use in shanding into non-nicotine flavours should be controlled or not. And there were some on yesterday's webinar who were worried about the safety aspects of 10% uh, concentrates of nicotine coming in. And again, they're the sorts of things where people will put forward in the submissions. Uh, there's a reason why the delegate has to read every single submission that comes in, even if there's several hundred. A final thing that we've been asked a few times uh, through the questions ahead of, or not a final thing, there's one or two more, uh, but we've been asked ahead of the uh, seminars is what will be the controls over doctors? And essentially, this is a discussion between the doctor and the individual who's talking about smoking cessation and, and so forth and transition from smoking to e-cigarettes. So while in law, an Australian prescription can only go up to a year long, in talking to various doctors, and we have been talking with the AMA and the College of General Practitioners and many other doctors and pharmacy groups, uh, in talking with doctor groups, it's likely that doctors will vary. Some will take the view that look, I'm just going to give this to you for 12 weeks and I want to see progress. Others will, will accept that there will be a longer transition. And that will be an individual discussion and decision between the doctor and the individual. As I say, a prescription can go for up to a year, but it's a doctor's choice actually as to the length of that prescription, the number of repeats and so forth, as it is for any other medicine. Doctors now can make the decision. So, for example, if you're being treated with for pain, a doctor may only want to prescribe for a few weeks so that you're not stuck on the pain medicine for months and months. 
Another question that we've been asked is, well, hold on, there's already a whole lot of nicotine products for smoking cessation. There's patches and there's even things that call themselves inhalers. And those things are either available in the pharmacy or in some cases available in supermarkets. So what's the difference between those things and nicotine containing vape liquids? And there are some fundamental differences. The biggest one is where they end up in your body. Because even the ones that are called inhalers largely only go as far down as your cheeks and the back of your throat and so forth. But the data that's been submitted to TGA, and all these products are registered medicines with TGA, so they are medicines. The data on even the inhalers shows that only a, a small percentage of the nicotine actually gets into your lungs. And the other data that we've been given on those shows that the actual level of nicotine that gets into your bloodstream from some of those is quite low. So patches are good, you don't have to swallow a pill or, or breathe anything in, you, you slap it on your skin in a, in a non-obvious place. But you only get a dribble of nicotine going into your bloodstream. And it actually doesn't mimic the smoking process all that well, which is why, while some people do give up smoking with patches and, and, and so forth, the success rate is only limited because it's a dribble that comes through your skin continuously to your bloodstream and that's very different from the hit of nicotine that you get uh, to uh, uh, when you either inhale a cigarette or even a, a fairly high strength or even middle strength uh, e-liquid. Uh, anyone and, and many on, the, on this webinar will know what I'm talking about with, with the hit of nicotine. Inhaling something that goes right into your lungs gets chemicals of any sort into your bloodstream and into your brain very quickly. And so the whole way it works within the body is very different from vaping as opposed to a patch or even a so-called inhaler. And when the committee advised the delegate, they looked at that, both the concentrations of nicotine being so much higher and also that big hit being so much higher and decided, therefore, it was more appropriate for a prescription medicine than, say, something available over counter. They also considered the importance as your, as your uh, health advisor for life uh, in involving the discussion with your doctors about smoking cessation. So they were, uh, they were the main uh, issues. The final one before we go to the questions and answers was what controls will there be on doctors and so forth? And as I've said, any Australian registered medical practitioner, by and frankly, it'll be their practice receptionist probably, who'll fill in the form and they'll sign it or, or endorse it. It's done online uh, and it's not much filling in at all. It's the, the person's name and registration number. Then it's then the doses, duration, products, all that, what else is involved in that consultation is totally between the doctor and their patient. Uh, there are no complex rules as to what has to be documented or, or what has to happen during that consultation. Uh, we, we believe that this should be a discussion between the individual and, and, and their doctor. The final thing, and I, I just remembered there's one more question that we were asked that is, is something we didn't cover. And that's, well, what controls are there over, over vaping devices? And as I've indicated, vape shops and other places will continue to be able to, fr to be free to sell those devices. They're not regulated by TGA. We know in the early days there were some problems, as there were indeed with certain Android mobile phones, of, of the batteries blowing up and things like that. Those safety issues are handled under Australian consumer law, which is managed by the ACCC and also on their behalf with various state and territory consumer authorities. So that level of control and uh, uh, safety management of, device, of vaping devices will continue. This proposal does not get involved with the devices themselves. Now, in some cases, of course, the salt might be integral to the device, so we're actually talking about that as a product. But our focus uh, and the delegate's focus is on the nicotine part. And at that, I'll turn over to my colleague, Tali, who has been moderating questions. Thank you. Um, I think you've actually covered quite a lot of the questions that oh. have come through, but we do have a few um, uh, ones that perhaps either could be expanded on or are new and haven't been asked before. So uh, we've got a couple of questions seeking clarification around how nicotine liquids 
would be treated under the uh, existing tobacco regulation. Um, so I can I'll got, I can elaborate on that one mm -hmm. for you. Really or like did you want? Yeah. Uh, hmm. So, for instance, displays in shops. Oh, I see. That yes. Sort of thing. Yes. I go on with you. Yeah. So, one of the other reasons why, if this goes ahead, there's a period of implementation, relates to making sure that there's some alignment in some of the state and territory rules around e-cigarettes and if a Commonwealth rule comes in. So, uh, as I said, while it's premature to finalise any discussions because a final decision hasn't been made, the state and territory tobacco regulators are aware of this and are looking at whether there's any inconsistencies in law. To go to the bigger question of will I be able to go to Chemist Warehouse and see a six-foot-long banner advertising Brand X vape liquid, uh, and the price, the, the answer is not quite. So as prescription medicines, they can't be advertised. And whereas in the US, you hop off the plane, go to your hotel room, and the first thing you see on TV is an ad for prescription medicines. In Australia and most other countries, prescription medicines can't be advertised directly to the public. However, chemists and online sources will be able to say they provide products including vaping and vape liquids for smoking cessation, but advertisements of and they'll also be able to provide some price information. But advertisements of on uh, uh, detailed, uh, you know, describing individual products, uh, you know, outside the front of the shop will not be permitted. In the same way, you can't go to a chemist shop in Australia and see a big billboard advertising Viagra at the moment. So in Australia, it's one bit of advertising we don't have, prescription medicines. But people will be able to know which pharmacies uh, will have these products available. Now, I'm also aware, and maybe it goes back to when I first interacted with pharmacies in the 1970s, that there will be some pharmacists who will decide not to stock these products. The same way there were pharmacists back in the 70s, especially Catholic pharmacists who didn't stock the contraceptive pill. And uh, in, in that case, uh, pharmacists are duty bound under the Code of Conduct to advise where they can get that script pill. So if they, for various reasons, don't stock that, they'll have to say, well, this one down the road, but two blocks down has it. Or alternatively, we are anticipating there'll be a growing online and, uh, ability to fulfil the script in Australia, and you'll get your your thing sent to you by Australia Post or wherever overnight. Okay. Um, while we're talking about, um, I guess, some of the access, we've had some questions about or concerns about getting a prescription from a doctor. And uh, one comment is that uh, the AMA has said that they're not willing to endorse it. How am I going to get a prescription mm. from my doctor? So that was the AMA at an early stage. We have spoken at, with the president of the AMA and with several members of the AMA. And there's a difference when these products are seen by TGA as prescription only. And our much more recent view is that... Uh, many doctors will prescribe because doctors are interested in smoking cessation. We know the evidence for e-cigarettes is rather mixed and indeed many of the studies are too small to be clinically rigorous. But uh, we do believe that as part of a discussion between a doctor and a patient that uh, this will be an option for many doctors. And again, a bit like the pharmacist, if for some reason a doctor does not want to go this way, they're, they're, gen they're generally bound to be able to say, well, my colleague in this practice, uh, you know, will have that discussion with you and, and, and make that appointment. And of course, with telehealth, there will also be, as there are already some telehealth doctors who can do a uh, consultation regarding e-cigarettes and smoking cessation. Following on from that, there have been a couple of uh, questions and comments mm -hmm. around harm minimisation and the role of harm minimisation. Uh, including comment, uh, questions about uh, the involvement or consultation with addiction experts and how long-term users would be treated within this approach. So <clears throat> I think the aim of most health professionals, whether they're public health experts or whether they're individually practising GPs and specialists, would be that 
eventually getting people off nicotine is the most desirable outcome. Uh, I mean, nicotine is highly addictive and it's not good for an individual's health. There's, there's no way to sugarcoat that. Mind you, sugar's not good for individual health either. So, however, uh, doctors, again, in the discussion, will be pragmatic. And uh, remember, we are not, there's no restriction being placed on the duration of the prescription. And so some doctors will take a longer-term view of how long they should prescribe uh, e-cigarette nicotine for. Others will, will, will take a shorter-term view saying, I'll do this, but I'll do it for three months. Others may well write a script for a year and say, well, we'll come back about a year and we'll have a discussion about whether you feel you still need to be on it. So that, that discussion is a doctor-patient one. There's nothing in the regulation that, that specifies a maximum time other than the broader Australian thing that any prescription can only be valid for up to a year. Okay, um, back to a question about the regulations this time. Um, this is a question about whether consideration has been given to the customs prohibited imports regulations, particularly in regard to allowing snuff or chewing tobacco to be imported for personal use up to 1.5 kilos and allowance over 1.5 kilos for personal use with permission from the minister. Uh, thank you, Tali. So if the purpose of the use of uh, the snuff or the chewing tobacco is as an aid in withdrawal from tobacco smoking, then the effect of the decision, if it's made, would be to exclude uh, it from being scheduled and there would be no implications at all, therefore, of the decision for um, that interaction at all. There would be no interaction with that customs prohibited imports uh, law. If, however, it's not intended as an aid in withdrawal from tobacco smoking, then it wouldn't be so excluded. The effect would be, if the decision is made, that it would be included in Schedule 4 and a prescription would be required. So uh, it's a case-by-case -case, uh, individual um, assessment uh, purpose-driven issue. Okay, while we're talking about importation, I've got another question or comment uh, about asking why is personal the personal importation scheme from overseas, getting it from overseas vape stores, any different from getting it from, from within Australian vape stores? And I think we've had also some questions yesterday and today as well about why can't we just get it from a vape store, why pharmacy? So essentially the idea, whether you're obtaining a product from overseas or whether you're going to get it locally, uh, is the involvement of a medical doctor to have that discussion about smoking cessation. And uh, in having the discussion with a medical doctor, it becomes a prescription medicine. And in Australia, prescription medicines require either a pharmacist here to dispense them or them to be obtained on personal importation. Uh, that, that's the law of the land. And that distinction already exists. And, and it's an existing law of the land, yes. Mm, so, so, so because a, once you have a doctor write a prescription for something, a pharmacist in Australia has to dispense it unless it's coming from personal import. Okay. Um, we have another question um, and, and comment or concern that uh, the proposed route puts places, or I think I'll read this one directly, so moving forward, uh, this person has suggested we have more hands in the supply chain, the pharmacist, the wholesaler, the local courier, and it's querying that it may increase costs um, and create a sort of monopoly or duopoly with large, bigger pharmacies. Well, pharmacies are interesting in Australia. I mean, I know a bit about the structure of the industry. There are obviously big franchises, but there's also still a very significant number of local one-person small business community pharmacies and uh, people have their allegiances to both. Uh, often people will go to their local pharmacist more for advice about things, whereas when they like the discounts and the cheap perfume, uh, they go to the well-known big chains. So uh, I think that both types of pharmacies will become involved and uh, as far as add-ons in supply chains, uh, Yes, medicines go through several pairs of hands, but there's a trade-off with the economies of scale. And when you think about it, and if you don't believe that, go and have a look at the price of paracetamol uh, 
even even in a little corner pharmacy, it's like a few dollars. The price of paracetamol is actually cheaper than a than a packet of many lollies. So that that box of paracetamol has been through uh, all those pairs of hands, and yet it's still profitable for that pharmacy to sell for for three or four dollars a box. So uh, the economy of scale has done that to it uh, with the many pairs of hands. Well, for one of the questions that we were asked both yesterday and today is what is the role of big tobacco in all this? And actually, government officials in Australia under a international treaty are not allowed to engage directly with big tobacco. So, for example, even though big tobacco wrote to us about and wanted to meet with us about the recent uh, heat not burn tobacco regulatory decision, we refused to meet with them. We have, the only, we have had no meetings with Big Tobacco about this nicotine proposal. The only way we would have a meeting with Big Tobacco is if they put in a regulatory submission or, or propose to about putting a product on the market as a medicine. Then we would meet with Big Tobacco in the same way we'd meet with a pharmaceutical company. But uh, there is a provision where government officials are not committed to meet, and I think it's a good one, with big tobacco. So uh, there has been no big tobacco influence. They're obviously open to put a submission in, as they did uh, to uh, the heat not burn consultation. They can put a written submission in, but we can't meet with them. Okay. Um, so that was going to be my next question. So you've answered that, John. Um, <coughs> we've had a couple of questions about if smoking, well, here's one. If smoking so much more harmful to the public than vaping, why are we prohibiting vaping and not smoking? And along those lines, we had an earlier question about uh, vaping is scientifically being proven to be 95% <laughs> safer than smoking. So why are we doing this? Well, first of all, I think the 95% number is rubbish. It, it, it's actually been, I would say, fairly significantly uh, disproven. Vaping is certainly safer than smoking. The 95% came from a small group of people several years ago banding a number around a room. But I think it's a bit academic to decide whether it's 50%, 60%, 20%, 30%. There is unequivocal evidence that vaping is still harmful, but it is less harmful than tobacco smoking. As I said earlier, uh, we have no regulatory remit over tobacco smoking. So, you know, you could argue that uh, injecting heroin on a Friday night is more harmful than, than vaping, but we have no control over illicit drug injection. So, as a regulator, you, in law, need to make sure that you're only looking at things that are within your own regulatory power and then, re and then looking at them appropriately. Okay. The number of questions coming in is starting to slow down a bit, um, but I do am conscious there are some questions that perhaps people would like mm. to hear an answer to that from uh, yesterday's session regarding how will my GP know if what they're prescribing is safe? Um, mm. Okay, so uh, at the moment there's no plan or proposal from a delegate to uh, put in <coughs> a long list of uh, analytical and safety and quality assurance requirements for those products. However, in our discussions with, say, the pharmaceutical groups, they are interested in the products that are being sold uh, being manufactured to a particular quality. And so, again, we see that as something that if a pharmaceutical chain uh, you know, decides to procure three or four major suppliers' uh, e-juices, but they'd be having those discussions saying, well, show us the quality data. It's the same thing they do for any major procurement. They want to see that they're procuring quality products. So at the moment, the proposal is that the market will determine that uh, for uh, the quality and composition of those products. Again, that's one of the things that uh, is open to the public consultation. Some people at yesterday's seminar said, look, we, we think we'll put in uh, some quality proposals. The other thing too is that allowing a, an implementation time that's potentially six months will actually provide opportunities for the, um, 
the health peak bodies such as the AMA and so forth in conversations with us and others to actually look at what supports we can put in place for any health practitioners that are looking at prescribing the products. Okay. I just um, encourage people to take put in any more questions mm. that they have as they're slowing down. Um, and There's been a couple of questions about flavours of non-nicotine e-cigarettes. Yes. And uh, just to repeat, uh, there's no impact of this proposal from Medelica about non-nicotine containing e-cigarettes. Now, one of the things that Customs is nervous about, because again, they have some evidence that it's happening, is that some black market shipments may be coming in labelled as nicotine-free, but, but not, uh, but not uh, nicotine. And, uh, and at the moment, there's no way that Customs and TGA can intercept nicotine imports. There's no legal arrangement whereby under Commonwealth law, because customs have to operate under Commonwealth law, to intercept imports. So there's head of TGA, I've got to emphasise that. So, however, if uh, this comes in for nicotine and there's a suspicion that under the black market there's non-nicotine stuff labelled illegally, it can be held up, tested, and if it's, if it's fine, uh, it's released. If it's not fine, then regulatory legal action can ensue. Every year, we get, sadly, hundreds of parcels, or customs get them, labelled herbal medicine. And it might be herbal medicine that can relieve pain, it's claimed, or it might help your sexual performance. And sadly, a significant number of those parcels are tested, and they're full of very high concentrations of Viagra or opiates, painkillers and other things that are not labelled to make the herbal medicine work. And again, we do take, and you can look at the TGA website, we do take uh, legal action against many of those individuals and companies. So again, if it was labelled just as passion fruit flavour, no nicotine, our laboratories, there's over 100 staff who work in the department's laboratories, would be able to test those samples and let the good ones go, but take action against people who are fraudulently labelling products. Okay. We've also had a, uh, someone asking about it's the MOU that TGA have with customs to intercede in nicotine mm. imports and noting that um, they have there's actually no had no shipments uh, held up and asked for a prescription and then it's been released. So it could have been clarification around that. There is no MOU around nicotine between TGA and customs. If the shipment was suspected of having what are currently other prescription medicines in it, if it was bundled up with other things, it can be intercepted. Mm. Uh, but uh, as I say, the current issue is that the customs have no power mm. to stop nicotine at the federal border. Okay. Uh, a particular question here about concentrated liquid nicotine and the need for labelling. And this actually just came up yesterday as well, the question mm. about uh, labelling of products particularly around child, you know, preventing accidental poisoning? So, again, uh, there would be an expectation that any product sold through a pharmaceutical chain would be labelled to say what it is. It's uh, open to the consultation. So some people yesterday took the view, well, it's great, but there's not going to be any controls over the composition or flavours or concentrations. Some other people uh, at the webinar yesterday said, oh, what about you know, the really concentrated stuff? Is that appropriate to come in? Or what about bubblegum or other flavours? And our answer is, there's four weeks to go. This is a submission. We want a range of views, and we'll certainly get a range of views, but we want, we want to get feedback, and the delegate will then make his or her, and I say his or her because there's two senior doctors who are medical delegates, and one, one male, one female, uh, they'll make their decision uh, around uh, around it because by law they have to consider all the submissions. Um, so I think we've got also a couple of comments here about black mark creating a black market and perhaps you know restricting to those over eighteen would be a way to another way of handling it. To if you want to expand on well, the well already of course sale to everyone is prohibited uh, and. It will be up to a doctor. I would be surprised if many doctors, you know, if a 15-year-old came in saying, gee, I'm vaping a lot on weekends, doctor, 
I'd be surprised if doctors would put a 15-year-old onto... It, will, it wouldn't be illegal, but I would imagine it would not be considered good medical practice to put someone that young onto a nicotine product, especially given uh, studies on nicotine, which have gone further than just rats and mice. Uh, there's been studies on, on nicotine and youth development uh, in, in using psychological and other measures. So I would be surprised, but it won't be, it'll be a matter of good medical practice rather than a matter of black letter law. Okay. Um, I think we're sort of getting towards the end. Perhaps one more, one or two more questions okay. if they come in. I've got one more question, and I think you've already answered it, but it, perhaps it just needs clarifying again. Um, this question is, if I get a script from my GP, can I still order my nicotine e-juice from a New Zealand vape shop, or am I only allowed to order it from a pharmacy in New Zealand? No, you can actually, with a personal import system, they can get it from a vape shop in New Zealand. You will have to have a copy of your original prescription retained, and we encourage people to take a photo on their mobile phone and just to include it with their order. And that way, when it comes in through customs, it will be coming in on an Australian prescription. Okay. I think that's, that's it. I don't mm. think, we, I think we don't, we've slowed down. Um, I think that we'll probably call that Draw that to a close. Any other? We'll be reviewing all of the questions afterwards across the the session and doing Q and A and doing some Q and A yeah. that'll be published. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks very much, everyone, for your participation today. I I know there's a range of views on this. As I said, the overarching drivers and the Q and A as well. We've got we've had 300 attendees at these seminars and about 300 questions. What we're going to try to do just before I finish talking about that is obviously some are very similar, so we'll try to distill that down to a set of, uh, of questions and answers and try to get them out in a week or so, but there's a lot happening uh, because we realise that people may want to see them well before the thing, the consultation closes, and I'll just remind people that uh, four weeks from today the consultation closes. So uh, there's also the email address which I'll go back to if I can work out how to use the computer. This one here, medicines.scheduling at health.gov.au. But if there's things that you think about, well, gee, they didn't answer that or I forgot to ask that, uh, do send your question there. Please do put in a subject line, uh, a, uh, you know, that it's about the nicotine webinars because there's a heck of a lot of other things going on. Uh, you might be aware that there's been some recent interim decisions on cannabidiol. There's currently a consultation going on about uh, MDMA and psilocybin, uh, LSD-related substances. So uh, all sorts of things come into that address. So, so please do put nicotine webinars in your subject line. Thank you again for your attention and participation, and please uh, do go ahead and share your thoughts in the submission. As I say, by law, they have to be considered by the scheduling delegate. So I can give you a guarantee that your submission will be read. And thanks again to my colleagues for their participation today. Thanks very much.